uh, thank you, Matthew and Jorge, for uh, for attending, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Jason, for uh, for you know still giving this presentation in these you know very difficult circumstances. Um, so I guess the, for, uh, uh, since this was an online talk from the speaker's perspective, not much has changed. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, difficult uh, difficult times all over and. Uh, Maybe soon, or maybe for the next couple of months, these will be the only kind of seminars we're allowed to have. Um, so uh, in any case, so let me introduce today's speaker. So today's speaker is Jason Bramberger, who is currently at the University of Victoria, uh, where he's a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, Jason did his PhD at the University of Ottawa uh, under the direction of uh, Benoit Dion and Victor Aubrain. Uh, and uh, after that, he's been uh, a postdoc, an NSERC postdoc, at Brown University, where I think he worked with Bjorn Sunset, is that correct? Yep. Okay. And then uh, after he came uh, as a PIMS postdoctoral fellow to the University of Victoria, uh, where is that a universe? Is, is that a departmental postdoc position, or is that working with a specific group or people? Or uh, I'm working with uh, David Goloskin and and, and okay, that's what I figured. Uh, Okay, great. So uh, thank you for uh, giving this presentation. We look forward to hearing it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, if I may remind the audience to uh, mute their microphones to uh, pre uh, to prevent feedback. Sorry, uh, I'm just going to minimize this. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for the very kind introduction, Bernard. And uh, you know, this this is actually quite convenient given the circumstances and, and you know we didn't foresee this coming but it, it wound up being uh, you know the necessary approach for giving a seminar today so what i want to talk about today uh is my my research that i conducted uh at brown university primarily but it's continuing it's evolving it's growing uh and and as i uh, am talking about this please keep in mind that all of this is in collaboration with my advisor bjorn sanchdata uh, and there are a few other uh, collaborators along the way. Now, what I want to talk about today is snaking bifurcations in higher space dimensions. So the way I want to walk you through this talk is I want to give you a, a, a kind of a lengthy background about snaking bifurcations in one spatial dimension. Don't worry, I'll define all of the words that I'm, I'm using here. And then I want to show you the sort of open problems that are left here uh, as we move up to higher spatial dimensions, and in particular, how my work has tried to answer some of these problems. Now, the theme that runs through all of my work is the investigation of what are referred to as localized structures. So I have some examples up on the board of where you can find localized structures. Uh, they abound in nature. We find them arising in places like chemical and physical or biological processes. But in the case of uh, the bottom right here for crime hotspots, we also find them in things like sociological contexts as well. Now, they also arise particularly as solutions to spatially extended mathematical systems. And we have a precise definition of what these things look like as solutions in this case. And that is in some compact region of space, they resemble a pattern or activated state. And then outside of that compact region, they just resemble some background or homogeneous state. Right? So take the vegetation patterns, for example, your, your localized vegetation pattern, you know, that localized grass bit would be your activated state. And then the sand in the background or the dirt, that would be you know, your background state. And so the reason I give you these, these four examples in particular on this board is because we have fairly well formulated models in mathematics that describe all of these pattern forming phenomena. And in particular, they're all just uh, systems of reaction diffusion equations. And so the, the questions that I ask myself while, while I investigate these localized structures is first of all, why do all of these systems exhibit localized structures? What is it about these, uh, these systems that fundamentally leads to these types of solutions? And so then the question is more a question of genericity, right? It's, it's what do these things have in common? What is the, the lowest common denominator that I can use to guarantee that I, I observe these localized solutions? 
And then you can ask a, a slightly more mathematical question. And that is, if I have a parameter in these models, then what happens to these localized patterns as I move the parameters? How do they, uh, how do they bifurcate? How do they change with respect to these parameters? Do they only exist in some compact region of parameter space? Or do they exist for all of the, par the parameter uh, values? So these are all of the kind of questions that are running through my research and, and being asked in the background here. And now, uh, any sort of exploration of, of pattern formation in reaction diffusion systems or even localized structures typically begins with the discussion of the Swift-Holmberg equation, if you're going to talk in uh, some sort of generality. So you can see in the top left of the board, I have a, the Swift-Holmberg partial differential equation. You can see that it's a fourth order PDE in space. That's coming from the, the delta operator here. That thing is the, the usual Laplacian. That's your sum of second order spatial derivatives. This thing can be in any spatial dimension that you choose. And you can see on the left-hand side, we have a time derivative. So this thing is a dynamic equation. It's evolving in time. And the Swift-Holmberg equation was originally given to us by uh, physicists Swift and Holmberg, in which they were trying to formulate uh, an asymptotic partial differential equation that described the onset of Rayleigh-Bernard convection. So for example, this bifurcation parameter mu that I have in my system, uh, in the context of the Rayleigh-Bernard convection, that would correspond to being proportional to the temperature difference between the two sheets or layers used to observe uh, such a convection. Now, uh, I am not going to uh, sit here and purport to be a fluid dynamicist. This is not something that I am an expert in. Uh, and in particular, I'm not particularly motivated by, say, really Bernard convection. But the reason I like the Swift-Holmberg equation is because it's been shown to be the dominant leading order partial differential equation uh, when a system of reaction diffusion equations undergoes a Turing bifurcation. So if I translate all of what I just said there, it just means that the Swift-Holmberg equation is a normal form. And when we think normal forms in math, we should think genericity, right? These are the, the generic ways of capturing uh, specific aspects of dynamical systems. And in the context of the Swift-Holmberg equation, this is your sort of generic pattern forming system. And where this pattern forming property comes from is essentially summarized in this bifurcation diagram in the right corner of this uh, slide. So this is in one spatial dimension that I'm showing this, this bifurcation diagram, but you get similar bifurcation diagrams in almost every spatial dimension. And so what you can see here is that for all positive mu, the background state u equal to zero, this is stable. And furthermore, beyond this, the stability of this state, uh, this, this uh, u equal to zero, this trivial solution, comes in the form of a Turing bifurcation, the onset of this stability. And you can see from this bifurcation diagram that that Turing uh, bifurcation, it is subcritical. And so you have an unstable branch of spatially periodic steady state solutions. I'm going to refer to these as roll patterns from now on. And you can see that if you continue that unstable branch of roll patterns, it eventually terminates in a fold bifurcation where it meets another stable branch. And what I want you to notice in this picture is that in between the Turing and the fold bifurcation in parameter space, there's a region where you have at least two uh, stable steady state solutions to this Swift-Holmberg equation. That is both the, the trivial solution and the roll patterns. And so when you have these two stable patterns, we refer to this as bistability in the system. And when you think of bistability, you should think of this as a sort of competition, right? There's two candidates for uh, patterns that should be able to be observed. The question is, which one is more likely, you know, in some sort of statistical sense? And so maybe if I brought this question to a physicist, they would say something like, well, uh, it depends. Is there a notion of energy associated to your system? And indeed, if, if the Swift-Holmberg equation is a gradient flow equation, it says that everything settles into an equilibrium eventually. And this, this gradient flow structure endows an abstract notion of, of energy. 
And so the physicist would tell you, okay, whichever one of these has lower energy is the one that you should be more likely to observe, you know, in, in some sort of statistical abstract sense. Uh, and you can set this up as a, a dynamic problem mathematically. You can start with an initial condition to the Swift-Holmberg equation, where half of the space is the trivial solution u equal to zero, and half of the space is the roll patterns. And you can start advancing this in time. And if you see the roll patterns, say, advancing or moving or invading into the trivial solution, you would infer that they have lower energy. And of course, vice versa, in the case if u uh, equal to zero travels into the, the roll patterns. But it turns out this is actually not at all what happens. In the bistable region, we have the formation of localized steady states uh, in here. And these localized steady states take on the form of what I'm showing you in the bottom of this slide, where you can see that inside a compact region of, of space, they resemble your stable roll patterns. That is, they look almost spatially periodic. And then outside of this compact region, they resemble the other stable pattern, u equal to zero. And so why I want you to understand that these things are so unintuitive is because that notion of energy should, or, or it leads us to conjecture that these things shouldn't exist as steady states, right? The region of localization should either expand or contract in on itself, uh, but it should not be able to be held in this uh, steady state pattern way. Now, what's even more interesting is that if you start continuing these things in the bifurcation parameter, they trace out a very intricate, a very complex, but a very organized bifurcation diagram, which we refer to as a snaking bifurcation curve. So, this snaking curve is shown to you on the left hand side where I'm plotting the bifurcation parameter mu on the horizontal axis and the L2 norm of the bifurcating solution along the vertical axis. And what you can see from this video is that the bifurcation curves, they bounce back and forth between two fixed values of mu, all the while almost monotonically ascending in norm. And what you can see from the right-hand side is that this monotonic ascension in norm is caused by adding more roll patterns to the localized solution at the interface between those two stable patterns that characterize it. So it, on the right-hand side, you can see that the localized pattern that I'm plotting is only half of the pattern. This thing is just symmetric over x equal to zero, but the reason I only give you half of it is because it's easier for you to see how this thing grows as you ascend the bifurcation structure. Now what's more is that you can see from my bifurcation curves on the left-hand side that there is not one, but two snaking curves. And the other one given in orange corresponds to a similar solution it's just that this solution has a minimum at x equal to zero as opposed to a maximum. And so then the, the early questions from, uh, that, that stemmed from this work were, first of all, why are we observing these solutions? They seem to violate our physical intuition of the, of the, of the Swift-Holmberg equation. And second of all, why do they trace on a bifurcation structure that has such an organized uh, uh, structure associated to it? And the way that you can answer these problems is using spatial dynamics. So that is, if you think about these things as being steady state solutions to the Swift-Holmberg equation, that is, you can write down these, these steady state Swift-Holmberg equations, so just getting rid of the time derivative term. And you can see this on the, on the top left of the board, where now you have an ordinary differential equation where the evolution is taking place with respect to the spatial variable, hence the term spatial dynamics. And you can cleverly rearrange this into a system, a first order system uh, of ordinary differential equations. And you can see that this, the phase space of this system is now four dimensional. The other thing that I want you to notice is that there is a reversible structure of this uh, spatial dynamical system, it comes from the fact that the Swift-Holmberg equation has a symmetry that you can let x go to minus x. So that's the reflection symmetry that I was taking advantage of in the video that I showed you on the previous slide. 
And this duality between the, sec, uh, the steady state Swift Holmberg equation and this first order system leads to a duality of how we think about these localized solutions. The way that you can intuit these solutions as uh, solutions to the Swift Holmberg equation is that you're really gluing front and back solutions together to create uh, localized solutions. So that is, these front and back solutions are characterized as steady state solutions uh, where half of the phase space is one of the looks like one of the stable patterns, so say u equal to zero, and the other half of the phase space resembles, say, the roll patterns. These are what I described uh, a few slides ago with the dynamic problem, but you can find that these things can hold as steady state solutions, and therefore, if you just chop them along the roll patterns, you can exploit the x to minus x symmetry, which tells you that if you have a front, you must also have a back. You can chop these things, you can tie them together in an appropriate way, and this is exactly what gives you those localized solutions uh, that were so unintuitive. Now, you can also see that if you want to make a longer roll plateau, a longer region of uh, localization, you just need to chop further into the front and back solutions. Now, this is just a sort of heuristic way to think about this, but you can do this with analysis by looking at the first order system here in the top right. And the way that this goes forward is that in this first order system, there are there is a steady state, u equal to zero, and there is also a periodic orbit corresponding to your roll patterns from the Swift-Holmberg equation. And therefore, a, a front or a back solution, they are heteroclinic orbits that asymptotically connect u equal to zero to uh, the periodic solution, which I refer to as u star in this case. And therefore, the gluing procedure that I described for the Swift-Holmberg equation can be thought of as taking these heteroclinic orbits and patching them together uh, to create a homoclinic orbit. And what we find is that these localized solutions manifest themselves as homoclinic orbits in the spatial ODE, for which you asymptotically connect to zero, that represents your localization. Uh, so as x goes to plus or minus infinity, you go to zero. But what happens in between that is you enter a neighborhood of this periodic orbit, and you wrap around that periodic orbit for some finite number of times. And you can achieve this in a completely rigorous manner using uh, well-established techniques such as Lin's method, they tell you that you can wrap around that periodic orbit arbitrarily many times and get longer and longer regions of localization. Now, what I want you to understand from this is that really it's the front and back solutions that drive the formation of the localized uh, structures. That is, heteroclinics dictate the existence of these homoclinics in the spatial system. And therefore, if heteroclinics are dictating the existence of these things, they should also be dictating uh, their bifurcation structure. And so if we think about what happens with a heteroclinic orbit, you know, it's defined to be a uh, trajectory in this, this four-dimensional phase space that lies along the intersection of stable and unstable manifolds. And you can imagine using your bifurcation parameter to break that intersection. You can wiggle those two manifolds off of each other. And this is, this is hypothetical. So what I'm drawing for you, I'm illustrating this process um, on the slide here. Again, I don't have the ability to draw in four dimensions. So I've projected these into two dimensions. Now my heteroclinic orbit takes the form of just these, these black dots lying along the intersection here. And you can see what's being described in this uh, scenario is that you are wiggling the intersection of these two manifolds off of each other. And this is leading to a saddle node bifurcation, this quadratic tangency in these manifolds that is eventually broken. So that gives you an intuition for the left and right extremes of these, these snaking curves. It's telling you that generically it should be uh, characterized by these saddle nodes where you're just breaking this heteroclinic tangle. And again, remember, the heteroclinic uh, solutions dictate the existence of the homoclinic solutions. 
And therefore, if you lose the heteroclinics, you should also lose the homoclinics. And so you can actually rigorize this. You can put down a direct theory and it says exactly when you should get snaking bifurcations. And this is characterized by the following scenario. So if you take your bifurcation parameter mu and you drag it across, say from very, very small to very, very large, and you watch these two manifolds that characterize the heteroclinic orbits, if they move right through each other, this is what's being described on the, on the slide here, then you can see that the left and right extremities here are characterized by saddle node bifurcations. These are those quadratic tangencies. And this is exactly what gives you a snaking bifurcation. So that is dragging the bifurcation parameter causes these two manifolds to drag through each other. But it turns out that you can theorize that there is another possibility here. And the other possibility leads to what are referred to as isolas. So an isola is a closed curve or a loop in the bifurcation structure. In this case, if you find yourself with one isola, you can show that you have infinitely many of them. They have been observed in a number of different systems that are not necessarily the Swift-Holmberg equation. But in this case, you can show that the way to get isolas is that if you start dragging mu across a continuum of values, and you what you should see with the the uh, heteroclinic orbits is that the intersection begins to progress or these two manifolds begin to progress through each other but eventually stops and comes back to where you started and so what you have in phase space is it looks like you created an artificial loop by dragging mu across you get back right to where you started in this intersection and this artificial loop is actually what creates real loops in the bifurcation diagram now, all of that was to uh, convince you in, in some way that we have a fairly complete understanding of what's going on in one spatial dimension, right? We, we have an idea of what drives the existence and the bifurcation structure of these things. And I want you to understand that it's really just those front and back solution, those heteroclinic orbits. Furthermore, we, can, we actually know the stability of these things. And again, this should be fairly intuitive to, to those of us that are listening, because if the heteroclinics are dictating the existence in the bifurcation structure, they should also be dictating the stability. And the way you can think of this is if you take a back and a front solution, you glue them together to create a localized structure. If both the back and front were stable, then you get a stable uh, localized structure. That's one way to intuit how the stability of these things should work. Now, as I mentioned, Jason, can I ask a question about that? Pardon me? Can I ask a question about that? Yes. So that's a hand wavy argument, though, right? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, has it has the stability in a rigorous way? I mean, it has been studied, right? Yes, this was done by Sanch Data and McCready's in a, a 2018 paper, I believe. Okay. So, um, I mean, because, so the spatial dynamics, of course, doesn't have any time in it. So, I mean, in principle, the spatial dynamic itself is just about existence of the solutions. Yes, yeah. But the, the okay. argument goes that you, you use, um, so this is spectral stability I'm talking about, not nonlinear stability. Okay. And spectral stability relies on things like Evans functions, which essentially translate this back into a spatial dynamical problem. Well, I mean, I fully understand that if the homoclinic, um, I mean, if, if, if you're getting near something that's unstable, then, then you don't have much hope for stability. But the other way around is not so obvious from a rigorous point of view, right? If, you, if you're hovering near something stable, that doesn't mean that the thing that you're stu studying itself is, is stable, of course. I mean, it's an indication, but. Uh, yes, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. So maybe, uh, maybe I misspoke a little bit. Uh, we do know the, the unstable piece for sure, as you, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, the stable piece might be a little bit more nuanced, uh, and I, I'm not entirely sure if that is 
completely shown or if it is just conjectured with this this sort of hand wavy argument. Okay, uh, you mentioned spectral stability. Um, so, uh, and, and not nonlinear stability, have they not been able to bootstrap one to the other or, or, or simply they haven't tried? Uh, I, so again, this is this is more uh, Bjorn Sanchez's research program than mine. Uh, sure. I just think that because the spectral stability is so recent, he, he could be working on this actively at sure. the moment. Uh, I'm just not aware right. of it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh no problem. Okay, so so a few other things to just mention here. Uh, as I have mentioned, there is a, a symmetry uh, letting x go to minus x in the Swift-Holmberg equation. So immediately, one of the things that us as mathematicians are interested in is uh, what happens if I break this symmetry. And in this case, uh, what happens is that you can show the staking cur curves will degenerate into infinitely many isolas. So what you should think about here, really, is that snaking is more of a co-dimension one phenomenon. It doesn't seem to be robust with respect to some sort of generic perturbations. And in that sense, it's really symmetry that's leading to snaking. So isolas should be considered as the uh, maybe the dominant form of bifurcation structure for these things. Similarly, you can think about periodic orbits. Uh, and in this case, it's possible to have stable and unstable manifolds that are uh, non-orientable in this case. And similarly, recent work has shown that generically this should lead to isolas in the bifurcation structure. And now the last thing that I just want to touch on with respect to 1D is that you don't have to have just one region of localization. That is, you don't have to have a connected region. You can have multiple di uh, different disconnected regions of localization. This would lead to so-called multipulse solutions. You can see these, uh, for example, in the top right. And in this case, in the spatial dynamical system, this would correspond to a homoclinic orbit that leaves u equal to zero, wraps around the periodic orbit for some uh, extended period of time, leaves the neighborhood of that periodic orbit, gets back close to zero, goes back near the periodic orbit. It repeats this process a finite number of times before eventually converging back to zero asymptotically. And in this case, the same thing, we find that these generically lie along isolas. So what I want with this is to convince you that we have a fairly complete picture of what's going on in one spatial dimension. And so because we have such a good understanding in one spatial dimension, uh, there was a little bit of um, conjecture that was put forward that if you start looking in higher spatial dimensions, you should find similar phenomena. Although these same arguments won't necessarily apply, we, it was a little bit expected that you should see similar bifurcation scenarios, so things like snaking or isolas. They might be a little bit more complicated because you have a few more degrees of freedom, uh, directions to move in, but things should be quite analogous. And the immediate place where this line of thinking was, was applied to was when you start looking at radially symmetric patterns in higher spatial dimensions. These are exactly the analogous solution to those, um, to those spatially localized solutions from the 1D Swift-Holmberg equation that I showed you. An example is given in this inset in the middle of the slide where you can see a contour plot of a radially symmetric pattern. You can see that if you take a, a radial cross section of this solution, it will roll for a bit and then it will go to zero asymptotically. So it's going to look a lot like that solution I showed you in the video a few slides ago. And because these things resemble so much about the one-dimensional spatial system, we thought that they should have a similar bifurcation scenario, or at least similar arguments should be able to describe their bifurcation scenario. But as you can see on the left-hand slide, where I'm providing the bifurcation diagram for dimension two, you can see that this is not at all the case. And in particular, if you look at uh, the bifurcation diagram of the relevant solutions, these radially symmetric patterns, uh, for any dimension larger than one, you get a bifurcation diagram that looks almost identical to the one that I show you on the left-hand side. In particular, what you can see about this bifurcation diagram is that it breaks into three distinct components 
given by the different colors on this uh, picture here. The first of those components at the very bottom in teal is referred to as the lower snaking branch. So the, the lower snaking branch is the one that most resembles the snaking curves from the one-dimensional system. That is, you have two curves that emanate from uh, the trivial state, and they bounce back and forth on each other, and they, they look like they snake. You can see there's a slight bend, but they, they look like regular snaking patterns when you zoom in. But eventually those two curves, they collide and they, they sort of tie off this lower snaking branch at a finite height. And so what we find is that the lower branch has a finite height and the second the lower branch is done, begins the next major region given in green here, which is referred to as the, the isolas. So that is, there are a ton of isolas. They all are closed curves. They look like little figure eights in this case. And they're all just stacked on top of each other like pancakes in there. And again, uh, what gonna, we find uh, with that question, Jason? Sorry? Can I ask another question? Sure, yeah. Um, for the bottom branch, um, so is it similar to the one dimensional situation where the two different um, curves correspond to minima and, and maxima at zero? Um, no, not in this case. No, there is uh, mm -hmm. it, because it's all one curve, so there there are separate curves. Oh, okay. I thought there were two curves. curves. Okay. Sorry. The, uh, uh, there's only one curve in this case, not two. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. And then uh, if I look at the picture of the, uh, I mean, next to it, uh, all of those uh, patterns and have uh, maximum at zero. Yes, yeah, these ones do. So th there will be a similar one for a minimum at zero as well. They just have okay. their own lower branch. So I'm a little bit confused when you said, uh, so I thought there were two curves because you said the uh, these things approach each other then eventually tie off. So what is approaching what then to just cause a tie off? Of these ones with maxima on them. But there are two distinct curves then or? Uh, yes, from my understanding, yes. Okay. All right. And and um, okay, but there is a branch with minima. You just didn't plot it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Thank you. So then, as, as soon as the isolas are are finished, begins a uh, the third major region given in brown, which is called the upper snaking branch. So the upper branch begins in a similar way to the lower, how the lower branch ends, in that you have two curves that emanate from the same point, and they begin to bounce back and forth on each other and, and give you this sort of snaking structure where it looks like they're going all the way up to infinity, uh, but we have no evidence to, to claim that, right? This, these are just numerical continuations. It is entirely possible that there is a fourth or even a fifth or a sixth region of this bifurcation diagram, which is just completely out of reach to our current numerics. So the question is why? Why do we have this, this type of pattern formation and these, these bifurcation structures that are occurring in this system? And the way that we decided to approach this problem is by looking at the steady state equation, again, associated to these radially symmetric patterns that's given to you in the top right of the board. You can see that it greatly resembles the one dimensional equation. But in this case, the dimension of the underlying space is explicitly represented in the, uh, in the equation. So it, it enters as a sort of parameter here. And the view that we decided to take on this is that instead of letting uh, the, the dimension n take on only discrete values, so say one, two, three, four, we decided to set it as a continuous parameter in this system. And in particular, what we, we wanted to do was center our analysis slightly to the right of n equal to one and introduce what we call this dimensional perturbation. So set n equal to one plus epsilon. And so what happens here is that now by, by perturbing epsilon into this equation, we can leverage all of our understanding about the one-dimensional equation, which I hope I convinced you on the previous slides 
is uh, very well understood. And therefore, we can perturb in this symmetry breaking term, this one over R times the derivative of R, in, an, in a hope to understand why we're seeing this complete degeneration of the snaking structure. And you can, you can follow similar methods to what we did or what was done for the one dimensional equation. You can recast this as a spatial dynamical system. Here now your independent variable is your radial variable describing how far you are from the center of that pattern. And you can see that the dimensional perturbation enters uh, in a relatively benign way, right? It, it enters linearly in the, the variables U2 and U4. Uh, but it does pose some problems. The first of which is that it, it's inhomogeneous. So this is a slight difficulty, but we can handle that. Uh, it also introduces a singularity at r equal to zero. Again, slight difficulty, but we can handle that. But there's a piece that's, that's not as easy to see here. And that's when epsilon is equal to zero, this, uh, this spatial dynamical system is Hamiltonian. That is, it has a conserved quantity. And therefore, uh, you really get, with this Hamiltonian structure, you get a dimensional re, uh, reduction. You, you're confined to the generically three-dimensional level sets. But the second you turn epsilon on, you break that Hamiltonian structure. So now you have the ability to, to explore this full four-dimensional phase space. And now that phase space is inhomogeneous. So you essentially are adding uh, not one, but two dimensions by adding in this uh, space, this dimensional perturbation. So nonetheless, we're able to describe what these, these uh, so-called radial pulse solutions, that's what we refer to these as. Uh, that's these localized solutions to the radial equation. We're able to describe geometrically what they should look like in this spatial dynamical system. And what I'm showing you is a, a picture of the anatomy of these things. And so of course, if these things are going to be localized, they have to lie along the stable manifold of the trivial equilibrium. They have to asymptotically go to zero. And so that gives us this, this rightmost component on, uh, on figure one here in the top left corner. Similarly, we have to account for the singularity at r equal to zero. That means we have to apply appropriate initial conditions. And to do this, we use a boundary layer. And it turns out that the, the appropriate initial conditions, they're just Neumann boundary conditions. That's u2 and u4 equal to zero. And so if we have a boundary layer and we know where this is asymptotically going to go, we just need to patch in the middle what happens. And that's exactly these rolling pieces, uh, which in this case corresponds to the trajectory in the spatial dynamical system wrapping around this massive invariant manifold that resembles a huge cylinder. And you might be thinking to yourself, why a cylinder? And there's a fairly simple argument to understand why this is the case. So uh, in the in the original spatial dynamical system, in the uh, one dimensional system, your localized solutions, they wrapped around a periodic orbit before uh, converging back to zero. Now, as I mentioned to you, the spatial dynamical system for the one dimensional equation, that is a Hamiltonian system. And we know that in Hamiltonian systems, rarely do you get a periodic orbit just existing by itself, but instead you get a stack of periodic orbits and each one lies in a different level set of this Hamiltonian. And so what happens now is that by perturbing it, by introducing that dimensional perturbation, you break the Hamiltonian structure. You're allowed to go through this perturbed phase space that correspond to the full four dimensional phase space. And therefore now you have the ability to wrap around this, this invariant manifold that was originally this stack of periodic orbits. And the, the main piece of this, uh, this analysis comes from understanding how you wrap around this thing, and in particular, guaranteeing that you can stay on this or near this invariant manifold for a sufficiently long time, which would increase the uh, region of localization in this original uh, radial pulse solution. So essentially what you need to do is protect yourself from falling off the top or falling off the bottom of this 
uh, this big cylinder. And so we can set this up uh, using traditional dynamical systems tools. We know that on the cylinder, we are just wrapping around in a straightforward way. So we can average out that part of the trajectory. And essentially what we can do is we can write a dynamic equation that describes our height on this cylinder. And that, that dynamic equation is given to you at the bottom of the board here. You can see that it's, again, inhomogeneous, as you would expect. Um, but also, you can see that it's singularly perturbed. And this is easy to understand because when epsilon is equal to zero, you are confined to a single height because you are confined to the level sets of that Hamiltonian. So it turns out that, that our analysis shows that if you really want to understand the existence and bifurcation structure of these radial pulses, you need to understand how this height variable moves uh, dynamically in R. And what's great is that the leading order dynamics of that equation, that was the function capital F on the previous slide, we can show that uh, this thing directly corresponds to the, the perturbation that's introduced into the spatial dynamical system, which allows us to trace back uh, exactly what that, uh, that those leading order dynamics look like, at least numerically. And we can use numerical programs such as auto to trace out what those leading order dynamics look like. So on the right hand side, you can see a contour plot in the bifurcation parameter mu on the horizontal axis and the height on the vertical axis. And what you can see is that there is a global attractor for every single value of mu in the height dynamics that is right near the h equal to zero set. And what I want you to understand is that these radial pulse solutions, they have to eventually get off the cylinder. So having a global attractor is not necessarily a good thing because I don't want to stay on that thing forever. I need to eventually get to zero asymptotically. And so you can use this structure to come up with the following results. The first of which is that you can only guarantee that you wrap around that cylinder a finite number of times. There's an upper bound on the length of the roll plateau. And so what we can also show is that upper bound, it exponentially decays in epsilon. So if you translate that back to the dimension, it exponentially decays in n. And that upper bound, it goes to infinity as n goes to one which is exactly what you expect from the one-dimensional equation. But for every uh, n greater than one, uh, you can show that that thing has a finite height. And what we can do is we can translate that back to the original Swift-Holmberg equation and use it, use it to infer the, uh, the upper bound on the lower snaking branch. Again, we can, we can test this numerically. These two things correspond quite nicely. What you can also do beyond that is you can show that the upper snaking branch, it can't, uh, what, for, for patterns with very, very long regions of localization, they can't exist for all values of mu. In particular, the longer the region of localization, the smaller the region and parameter space that they exist. And what this tells us is that that upper branch, or if there's something above it, whatever that happens to be, has to collapse onto a single value of mu. And you can see that in the upper branch on the bottom right corner here starting to happen, but it's taking a very, very long time. Now, with that being said, there are a number of problems still associated to this that we are completely unable to answer using these methods. The first of which is there is nothing in our analysis that indicates why we have isolas. Um, and then beyond this, we would like to understand when the upper branch starts. So that is, uh, we have a, a upper bound on the lower snaking branch. We would like to get a lower bound on the upper snaking branch, right? Does this thing decay exponentially in the dimension n as well? Or does it level off? Or does it oscillate? Or does it do anything interesting? But the real question that hangs over all of this is, is the bifurcation diagram that I showed you for the Swift-Holmberg equation generic in some sense? And, and what I mean by that is if you give me a reaction diffusion system that I know snakes in one spatial dimension, 
And I look at the associated radially symmetric patterns in higher spatial dimensions. I trace out their bifurcation curves. What should I get? Our analysis tells you that you will get a lower branch, uh, probably with a finite height, but it does not tell you that you will get isolas, and it does not tell you uh, how many different regions of the bifurcation diagram you're going to get. So the real question moving forward is, is the Swift-Holmberg equation characteristic of what we would see in other systems? Or is there something fundamental about, or, or something specific to the Swift-Holmberg equation that's driving this bifurcation diagram? And if it's the latter case, then it's not necessarily of interest to us because it, remember, we're looking at this from a perspective of generic pattern forming behavior. We wanna be able to describe large classes of systems through these methods, not necessarily just the Swift-Holmberg equation. So with that being said, let me transition to another uh, set of localized structures that can be observed in the Swift-Holmberg equation. In particular, this case comes from the, the planar Swift-Holmberg equation, and these are spatially localized hexagon patterns. So the video that I'm showing you comes from uh, the supplementary material due to an exhaustive study undertaken by Lloyd and collaborators in 2008, where they described numerically the existence of these spatially localized hexagon patterns and really just exhaustively uh, uh, talked about almost everything that they could find numerically related to these uh, types of patterns. Now, what I want you to notice in this video is that the bifurcation structure of the associated solution shown on the right-hand side looks nothing like the radially symmetric patterns from the uh, few slides ago that I just showed you. And it also doesn't really resemble the one-dimensional system where you had those nice ordered snaking curves. In particular, what you can see in this video is that there are, are big leftward swings in the bifurcation diagram. And that corresponds to the localized solution taking on the shape of a perfect hexagon. And then in between those big leftward swings, you see it becomes increasingly complicated how that hexagon adds a ring around itself in order to create a, a hexagon of say one diameter larger. And so this, this work, as I mentioned, was done in 2008. And to date, no one has been able to describe exactly or, uh, why this is happening from any sort of analytical perspective. We have to rely solely on numerics to understand these things. Now, interestingly, right around the same time that Lloyd and collaborators were working on uh, spatially localized hexagons as solutions to the Swift-Holmberg equation, Taylor and Dawes were investigating planar uh, localized patterns on planar lattices this time. So the, the specific equations that they were looking at are these lattice dynamical systems. They are infinite systems of ordinary differential equations uh, arranged along a lattice. They are coupled together via a coupling function, in this case represented by the five-point discretization of your Laplacian operator. So that's my sum of I prime, J prime notation. This means just the sum over the nearest neighbors. So that's up, down, left, and right. And on the right-hand side, you can see that you have that nonlinearity from the Swift-Holmberg equation. And this thing, again, promotes bistability in the system. Now, what you can see from the bifurcation diagram that I'm showing you in the video here is that it looks a lot like the hexagons. In particular, you can see that you have the big leftward swings. And as you saw in this video, those big leftward swings mark the localized pattern taking the shape of a perfect square. And then in between those big leftward swings, it becomes increasingly complicated how this, this localized pattern adds a ring around itself to go up to the next leftward swing where it takes on a square of, of one diameter larger. Now, the other thing that I want you to notice here is that near those big leftward swings are these increasingly complicated wrinkling components to the bifurcation diagram. And this is something that we did not necessarily see in the Swift-Holmberg equation on the previous slide. But it turns out that if you go up further for these localized hexagons, you start to see these wrinklings as well. 
And so when you put these two bifurcation diagrams next to each other, you see that they, re they closely resemble each other in a number of different ways, particularly with the big leftward swings and with the wrinkling uh, structure very close to those leftward swings for large localized patterns. And so our thinking here was that since the hexagons seem to be completely out of reach for any uh, current analytical tools, maybe what we can do is we can work with a lattice setting where things might be slightly more amenable to analysis. And in that case, we might be able to get some nice results that might inform how we think about the hexagons to the swift holmberg equation, which might be a slightly more realistic uh, system to look at. And so this is exactly what we did. We decided to center our analysis around the case of small coupling values. That is, uh, if you notice on my, my lattice system from a few slides ago, there was a coupling parameter, uh, little d, that, that goes in front of my coupling. And we noticed that if you set d equal to zero, so if you take d completely out, you get rid of all the coupling, you have an infinite system of ordinary differential equations completely uncoupled along the lattice. You can set up localized solutions in a very easy way. You can see how they arrange themselves in, in, the, in parameter space. And then what you can do is you can perturb in the coupling and you can use fairly established techniques such as uh, say the implicit function theorem or singularity theory, bifurcation theory, Lyapunov-Schmidt reduction, all in an effort to show how these bifurcation curves arrange themselves when you have very small or weak coupling introduced into this system. And in particular, what you can prove is that the bifurcation structure resembles greatly what we see in the one-dimensional swift holmberg equation. That's shown to you in the middle of the board. You can see that the, the curves, they bounce back and forth between two fixed values of mu and they're almost monotonically ascending in the, in the norm. And this monotonic ascension in norm is characterized on the left and right by this lexicographic ordering that we were able to, to create, which basically just tells you where the pattern gets activated, how it grows a ring around itself. So all of these patterns on this curve, they are D4 symmetric. They share the same symmetries as a square. And so you can really reject, uh, restrict your analysis to these small wedges in the lattice, and that's where the lexicographic ordering comes in. It shows you how these things will grow as you go up the curve. And so you might be thinking to yourself, um, you know, okay, you showed me a bifurcation structure on the previous slide, which looks nothing like what you just showed me you proved here. And so one possible explanation for that might be that as you introduce more coupling into the system, uh, these curves just become more and more nonlinear and they sort of bend and uh, you know, they become more complex, but nonetheless, they be, they're still diffeomorphic to the small coupling regime. But it turns out that this is not at all the case. In fact, in Taylor and Dawes' original numerical investigation of this last lattice model, they attributed the, the wrinkling in the bifurcation structure to what they refer to as switchback bifurcations. So what I'm showing you on the left and right hand side in these images are pre-switchback on the left, post-switchback on the right. And basically what's happening here is that when coupling is very weak, there are a number of other localized structures in this solution, in this equation, some of which lie along their own isolas, that is the closed curves, and some of these closed curves, as you increase the coupling parameter, they collide and attach themselves to the snaking structure from the previous slide. And so that's what I'm showing you on the left. In blue is one of those independent isolas. The gray curve in the back is my snaking curve from the previous slide. And what you can see is that by increasing the coupling parameter and moving over to the right, where you see post switch back, this isola has attached itself by colliding with the snaking curve. And now if you wanted to traverse this snaking curve by going around the previous saddle, you have to traverse the entire isola before doing so. So this is in part what, what drives the wrinkling that I showed you a few slides ago. Now what we were able to show with our work 
is that these switchback bifurcations are much more complex than what Taylor and Dawes initially led on. In fact, if you go further up the bifurcation structure, so that's solutions with larger regions of localization, then the isolas that collide are much more complicated. So I give an example of this again uh, on this slide. Again, left is pre-switchback, right is post-switchback. You can see that the isola that's going to collide in this case, it is slightly more complex. It has three saddles per side. And due to this larger, more complex structure, it collides with the snaking curve, again, given in the background in gray, at not one, but two points simultaneously by when you increase the bifurcate or when you increase the coupling parameter. And the effect this has, as you can see on the right hand image, is that you get a bifurcation curve now that is almost impossible to follow with the naked eye. But also the fact that you collide at two points simultaneously, it, it kicks off a piece of the previous bifurcation curve. That's this gray isola in the back on the right hand side. And what that means is that not only have you rewired this bifurcation curve, you added pieces that you didn't necessarily understand, but you also kicked off a piece that you did understand based on that, that theorem that I showed you a few slides ago. And so what we're able to do with our work is show that we expect infinitely many switchbacks to take place. We can also predict where they should take place. And this is you know, close to these, these leftward swings that I described. And finally, we are able to use some numerics to show that the switchbacks, they appear to exponentially cluster uh, around a single value in the, the coupling parameter D. And the effect that this has is that if, you're, if you plot the coupling parameter along a horizontal axis and you're looking at the bifurcation structure as you sweep over those coupling parameters, when D is extremely small, you get a very organized bifurcation structure that looks like the one-dimensional swift holmberg equation. But the second you cross that exponential clustering threshold, you almost completely rewire the bifurcation diagram since infinitely many switchbacks will take place uh, exponentially close to that value. And what you're left with is a bifurcation diagram that looks almost nothing like what your analysis predicted. And so um, we have a, a major problem here, right? If, if you're thinking about where all of this started, this all started with the hexagon patterns in the swift holmberg equation. And now that those hexagon patterns, they don't have a second parameter. They don't have something akin to the coupling parameter that we're using to observe these switchbacks. And therefore, there is no reason to assume that the switchback should be taking place in the swift holmberg equation. So in some sense, all of this work just gets us back to square one in some sense, because it tells us uh, that we don't really have an understanding of hexagons because we don't have this second parameter. So this is, this is a major challenge going forward. But beyond this, our work has opened up a new avenue for exploring spatially localized structures, in particular in this, these lattice equations. The immediate things that become interesting in this case are what are the influence of different coupling functions, right? If I showed you a few slides ago that the coupling function we were using was the typical uh, five-point discretization of the Laplacian, you can imagine using uh, something like a nine-point discretization instead, or even something uh, asymmetric, like an upwind scheme. And the questions here would be, what are the types of patterns that I expect to see? How do they bifurcate? And is it possible to inhibit switchback bifurcations from taking place? Now, another point is that I'm sure somebody is going to ask me that if I was so interested in understanding hexagons, then luckily for me, there's a hexagonal lattice I could have put my differential equation on instead. And I can assure you, this is exactly where our work started. We started by continuing patterns on a hexagonal lattice. And essentially what we found is that they trace out uh, similar bifurcation curves and they exhibit similar phenomena to the squares that were found by Taylor and Dawes. And so the election to work with the square lattice instead of the hexagonal lattice was one just of mathematical convenience. We felt it was easier to present the results on the, on the square lattice. And in particular, that lexicographic ordering was much easier for us 
to describe the expected bifurcation structure. And then finally, what I want you to take away from this entire talk today is that we have a very good understanding of what goes on in one spatial dimension. But the second we move up to, say, uh, two or three spatial dimensions where things might be slightly more realistic, more representative of what we see in nature, then a lot of that theory goes out the window. And so people in localized, people working on these, these localized structures, we're all sort of asking ourselves the same question. And that is, what intuition and what understanding from the one dimensional system can be carried over to these higher dimensional systems? Is there a way of, say, if I understand everything in one dimension, then I can say I understand almost everything in two dimensions? And then if I understand almost everything in two dimensions, can I understand almost everything in three dimensions? And you, the question is, can you create this inductive process? And I think what I've convinced you of today is that the answer to this is probably no, but we still have ways of, of exploiting the one dimensional system to understand some of these higher dimensional uh, equations. So thank you all for listening. Uh, it's been my pleasure uh, sharing this with you today. And I'm, I'm happy to take any more questions if they might arise. All right, thank you. Oh, we have at least two microphones on. <laughs> um, so uh, I have a question maybe before other people have questions as well. Uh, the bifurcation uh, the bifurcation diagrams that you mentioned uh, near the end, so in the ladder settings and so on, uh, some of them uh, looked like uh, maybe they were not smooth. Are they always smooth? Yeah, it's it's just the projection because these things exist in an infinite dimensional space. Oh, that's right. When yeah, yeah. Projection okay. Dimensions, they look like they're not smooth, but they certainly are. Okay. Okay. Other people have questions? While other people are warming up, I'll ask another one. Um, in the one dimensional setting, you had a lot of, uh, basically the mechanism for adding the roles was uh, repeated saddle node bifurcations. Is that uh, correct? Yeah. 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 Would there be a different equation, different master equation, probably not swift Hogenberg, uh, where you could go through a sequence of, say, repeated pitchforks, repeated something else, uh, resulting in different structures? Uh, I am not willing to say no, because, because I do not know definitively. Um, I'm just not sure if it's been observed. Uh, I suppose. Okay. There, there's nothing that says mathematically that you couldn't make that an assumption and, and go from there. But uh, well, I, I mean, pitchfork you know. is, is, is slightly less generic than saddle node, uh, but that, and of course transcritical is is very generic, uh, but that's really a kind of different kind. But I mean, my guess is that you could maybe design something to to have that uh, repeated pitchfork. Um, but whether it would, would would be interesting from an application point of view at all. Uh, is a separate question. Yeah, certainly, you know, I can write down the equation or I can write down the assumptions if, if you give me, you know, you could even give me a co-dimension two bifurcation that has to happen there. I could write down the right. equations and tell you what the expected bifurcation structure would be. I could proceed through the usual analysis. Um, in this case, it would just be a question of, is it describing something that we, we've actually seen or is it just for a little bit of fun mathematically. Right. So I would guess that the 2u squared term that you have in swift hogenberg is essential for you. Um, it's essential for the hexagons, from what I understand. But why oh, okay. do you... Well, it's, because... It's essential uh, by stability, right? Well, it's also, I mean, if I, if, if I ignore any kind of uh, spatial dependence in swift hogenberg it's also what's going to get me through saddle node, right? Yeah, but uh, there's also the cubic quintic equation as well, though, that will do the same thing. You just need anything on the back end. It's bi-stable. Right, okay. Yeah, 
Well, the, the original lattice analysis, uh, we don't use a specific equation. We just say, you know, assume your, your, your function on the back end, it, it's a bistable function. And it has these yeah. kind of bifurcations taking place on the left and right. Okay. Got it. Question from anybody else? And uh, if you have questions, remember to turn on your microphone. Well, at this point, I will assume that there's no questions from anybody else, which means that we can all turn on our microphone and thank Jason again for a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you.